Come on, sing it out now. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made, oh, I will see. Just sing out your song to the Lord. You can speak it out if you want. You can hum. Let's just make a joyful noise to the Lord and just, just rest in his presence. Sing it out. I see heaven invading this place. I see angels praising your 
holy name and I sing praises, I sing praises, I give you honor, worthy Jesus. I see glory falling in this place. I see hope restored in the healing of all disease. And I sing praises, I sing praises, I give you honor, worthy Jesus.
presence is here, His Spirit is here. As we create this space, would you respond to Him? Let's turn our lives over to Him. one more song. Let's sing this as a declaration of our faith. one 
Death could not defend its curse, and from the tomb, new life would burst. Tear through the chains that bound the earth, calling forth all life to a second birth. Praise the There is one name by which we're known, one faith, one hope to which we hold, your kingdom come, your glory known, the risen King upon Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. You have healed our guilt and shame. You have washed our scarlet stain. King of heaven, take your place. Hear your peace. Have your way in this place. We love you. And all God's people said, amen. Yeah. Hey, before you sit down, turn around, say hello to someone. Welcome them. If you don't know who they are, ask them their name. If you're online, say hello in the chat. We would love to know that you're here.
Hey, good weekend, everybody. I am joining you this weekend from uh, the side porch of my parents' house uh, in a little town called Brookneal, Virginia, just south of Lynchburg. And uh, there are lots of logging trucks passing by on the road out in front of me, so hopefully you won't hear too much of that. But before I get to the three things this weekend, uh, I want to remind you that you can complete a Connect card. If you are in person in worship this weekend, there is a paper Connect card inside of the weekly that will be collected a little later in worship. If you are watching uh, on YouTube or you're at our online campus on Sunday morning, you can text the word CONNECT to 859-279-4212. Uh, and uh, if you're a first-time visitor, you've been around with us for just a little bit but haven't completed a Connect card, we'd love for you to do that so that we can get in touch with you uh, and uh, let you know that we are glad that you are a part of GCF. Hey, you can also give uh, uh, at the hub in the lobby if you're in-person worship. The donation station is out there for cash, check, or card giving. Uh, you can also give by texting the word GIVE to 859-279-4212 or you can go to our new webpage, gcfvineyard.church and click on the PayPal link and give that way. So the first of our three things for this weekend has to do with our community service team, which actually had a meeting just before in-person worship this weekend. But we are in need of two or three more people to serve on our our community service team so if you're interested in serving on the community service team you can let us know we'd love to have you do that we're also that team is also working on all kinds of uh, community service activities for the second half of the year so we're going to be putting out lots of calls for volunteers so just want you to be aware of that last week uh, at the conclusion of the sermon I shared um, a story with you about a church that just decided to do a, uh, to simply start serving meals uh, in their community to, to, to grieving families who were in need of meals and how that rippled out into people coming to faith in Christ and beginning to experience a flourishing life in the kingdom of God. And we believe that's one of the things that can happen through our serving the community. So we're excited about the opportunities to do that and uh, excited in these months that come about how the Lord is going to use that to bring people to faith in Jesus and to life in his kingdom. Number two for this weekend uh, is a, uh, a book study group that I'm going to be leading this fall called Intentional Fathers. And we have sort of a crisis amongst boys and men in the country. And I see this, I have some kind of encounter every week with, with uh, a guy in his 20s or 30s or 40s who is just in a crisis in life. And so Intentional Fathers, uh, uh, Fathers is a book written by John Tyson. It's to help us raise, help fathers raise sons of character and consequence. It's not a study about like being manly men and about chopping down trees and smoking cigars and drinking bourbon. There's not necessarily anything wrong with any of that, but this is a, a study to help us make sure that we are raising sons who have Christ-like character, they have integrity, they contribute to society, they contribute to their churches, and they, they just embody Christ in their life. So if you uh, have got a young son, and especially if you've got a son kind of in that crucial age range of say age 10 and 11 up through 16 and 17 really want to encourage you to sign up to do the intentional father study this fall we i know it's going to be on monday nights probably at around seven o'clock don't know the exact exact start date but it will be in september but want to encourage those of you who are in fathers who are in that range to sign up for that and to go on that journey with me uh, this fall. Finally, thinking about intentional fathers reminds me of community groups. Pastor Roger is going to be talking more in the weeks to come about community groups kicking back off this fall. And uh, I just want to say that some of the most important relationships I have in my life are relationships with people with whom I have shared uh, initially in a community group setting at GCF. And so um, if you want, if you need, we all need, and if you want and need uh, sort of some relationships with other followers of Jesus that will, will keep you strong, keep you faithful, support you when need, you need support, give you an opportunity to support others when they need help in, in following Jesus together in the world, you'll want to get connected with a community group uh, this fall. And again, Pastor Roger will be talking more about that uh, in the weeks to come. So that's all I have for you this weekend from Brook Neal, Virginia. I look forward to being back with you guys next weekend. Good evening. My name is Jenna Brock. My husband and I, Roger, uh, have been attending GCF a little over eight years now. And I'm going to read you the scripture this evening from Isaiah 61, uh, 1 through 9. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, 
to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion to, be to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the renewed cities, ruined cities that have been de devastated for generations. Strangers will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and, your, and vineyards. And you will be called priest of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will be fed on the wealth of nations and in the riches you will, you will boast. Instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion. And instead of grace, you will, receive, you will rejoice in your inheritance so that you will inherit a double portion in your land and everlasting joy will be yours. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we just give you thanks um, for a chance to come together this evening um, to hear your word, to hear your goodness, to worship with others, um, and to fellowship. We ask that you just be with Judah as he um, speaks tonight. May you speak through him, Lord. May we all have ears and hearts open to hear what you have to say to us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good evening. Do I sound a little like Darth Vader to you guys? Just kind of a like, not the deepness, you know, I, I know that I don't have that, but kind of the shimmery kind of. I know what you're thinking. There's two people leading worship, and this guy's getting up to preach. Real skeleton crew this week, right? You're just like, man, what happened? Like, Jason's got COVID. Like, they, you know it's bad when they ask the drummer to come up to preach, you know? Like, they couldn't even get the keyboardist. Like, we know the keyboardists are more holy than the other. I get it. It's fine. Um, but no, I'm not Jason. Jason was the man you saw on the screen, if you didn't know. Um, my name is Judah Robinson. If you don't know me, I am, uh, I've been going to GCF with my family for quite some time, and I am... Uh, the director of our young adult and college ministry here at the Vineyard. And so welcome again if you haven't already been welcomed. We're glad to have you here. And um, really awesome time of worship. I really, really enjoyed that time of worship. And sometimes it's just good to have stripped back a little bit and you can just kind of focus on what we're singing and just focus on us singing together. So thank you guys for singing. Uh, that was awesome. I know the spirit feels like it's not quite there without the pad and the kick drum, but it's there. He's there. I promise he is. Um, I was really excited about this passage for this week, um, and the, the, many of you, if you've been in a church or know your Bible well, you probably have heard this passage before, um, but a kind of strange thing happened as well because there's, as we'll talk about in a little bit, a theme of going from a lot of bad things to good things, um, you know, bind up the brokenhearted, comfort those who mourn, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but a kind of reverse thing happened where I kind of slipped into the space of thinking about all the bad things going on in the world, you know, it's not like it's that hard to do these days, really, coming, being in a pandemic, and just, I don't even want to list them, because it's just tragic to think about, but you know, as well as I do, a lot of the just tragic things going on in our world recently, and this funny thing happened where this memory popped up um, of um, something that happened to me, uh, or more so I witnessed happen when I was in college here at the university. Um, it was my freshman year, and there was another kind of string of some not-so-great events that happened, and one of those was um, some turmoil in the Middle East, specifically some uh, war and conflict in uh, Israel-Palestine with Israel and Gaza, and I'm sure you've heard several times that there's been conflict in that region. It's just a rough situation. It's really heartbreaking. And, uh, a Facebook friend of mine, I won't call him a friend necessarily, but a Facebook friend of mine had posted this article that was basically detailing a lot of the humanitarian crisis that was happening as a result of that uh, conflict. And she posted the article, and I read it, and it was interesting, etc., but in the description, what she actually posted above the article was just a few simple words. She, and I'm not picking on this person, I promise. 
She tagged then President Obama, just you know, in blue text it says you know, President Barack Obama or whatever, do something, three exclamation marks. So maybe your humor is not as dark as mine because I laughed when I saw that. Um, <laughs> and um, that's okay, that's fine. But I laughed when I saw that at the time because I was like, what kind of cognitive dissonance? Again, I'm not picking on this person, I promise. But I was just like, what kind of cognitive dissonance or like weird world situation do we live in where we're just on Facebook being like, Obama, do something, it's bad. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's bad, do something. It's just, it was just like this, it was just so funny to me because I was like, is he going to see that, you think? Like, maybe one of his interns, maybe. And then like, anyway, so it was funny to me, I guess. But what was really funny about it was because I had this kind of critical response to it, but then I was like, well, you know, I get it. Like, that's like our response to when things are just going really bad, right? Like we just, and maybe you can relate with me uh, to this now in this kind of stage we're in, but like when things go bad, we just kind of look for the people that we think are supposed to make them right. You know what I'm saying? No matter who that is for you, and you know, spoiler, hopefully it's Jesus, but no matter who that is for you, it's really easy just to be like, man, this is terrible. Biden, do something. Trump, do something. Oprah, do something. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's a pretty natural response because we want to look to our leaders, the people that are put in these positions to make our society better, supposedly. We want to look to them to help make the wrongs right. Trump, do something. Biden, do something. George Washington's ghost, you know, whatever. Whatever it takes. Things are not right, and we need somebody to make them right, right? This is just a, a common thing that we feel. We feel the ache of wrong, and um, part of our theme for this, this series is righteousness and justice, that there's a lack of righteousness and justice, and we see all the bad things, and it's like, what's the answer? Who's going to do something about it? Um, in a very similar way that we experience this, when we approach this passage, it's pretty quick to see that Israel has not been in a good place, and there's been um, some bad things happening, uh, so to speak, to say the very least. Um, and there's, you know, some discussion about when this particular chapter in this area of Isaiah was written, but almost everybody agrees it's talking about Israel being in exile. It's kind of prophet, prophetic declaration to Israel having been humiliated and shamed, exiled, taken away from their promised land, forced to be slaves in another world, uh, in another nation. And um, right at the beginning, we have this speaker who just comes in and says, basically, I'm here. The Lord sent me. He anointed me to make good out of the bad, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, to release from darkness the prisoners. Because when things get bad, as we can tell from history, our own history, but especially history in the Bible, when things get bad is when the Lord anoints a leader to make things right. We see this all the time. It's a common pattern in the Old Testament. And, you know, there's all of our favorite Bible heroes are basically people that the Lord saw that Israel needed somebody to help them, and he called them out and anointed them. And again, this happens over and over again. It may look different. The anointing may look different, but it happens. Moses, Aaron, and the Levites and the priests, all the judges, King Saul, King David, the prophets, on and on and on. And he uses the word anointing, and that word anointing just means, um, as you may know, to be uh, means the pouring on of oil onto somebody as a sign of a consecration for a task. So when a time comes, the Lord puts his spirit on somebody and in lots of cases, they're anointed either symbolically or physically, like the priests, to do a specific task, task to meet a specific purpose. Um, and in the Torah, one of the, which is, or the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, where the law, the first stories of Israel is laid out and the law um, is created and given to Israel, um, we see this specifically happen with the priests and the Levites, who went through a really intense cleansing process. They got these really special fancy clothes that nobody else got to wear, and they were anointed to do a specific purpose that looked different than the rest of Israel. They were called to help guide sacrifices, to receive the sacrifices of the people, to take care of the temple, oversaw worship, so on and so forth. So there was a specific task. They were pulled out of the rest of their people to do something different. They were made to even look different. They were anointed physically to do that task. We need anointed leaders in our lives and not just leaders because we know that we aren't just, we need to know we aren't just following other humans, but we're following God. And that was the role of the priests and the Levites was they were kind of an intermediary between the Lord and the people of Israel. 
And um, going back to that list I said earlier, and maybe you can imagine more of the people in the Bible that were called out and anointed to do something specific. Um, so the story goes over and over again that they fail, right? I mean, that's like, like, that's like part of becoming an adult Christian is realizing all of these stories about these people were painted in really cool ways, and then you're like, well, they were all awful. Like Samson's this like cool, strong guy, and you're like, oh my gosh, Samson was gross. <laughs> um, that's literally the story of the Bible. It's supposed to be, we're supposed to see how these people are anointed to do things. They rise up and none of them can really do it. And we can say the same thing about our leaders, though they're not all anointed, but we continuously, continuously see leaders rise up. We hope they're going to do the thing that we want them to do, and then they don't fully do it. I mean, there may be people that do it and do it well and do it faithfully, but they don't do it without fault. Unfortunately, we see this a lot in the church right now, too. But at the beginning of the passage, we're introduced to this speaker, and he says that he's anointed to do one specific thing. The Spirit of the Lord is on him and anointed to do a task. So, good, great, right? That's, that's what we want. We want an anointed leader because they come and they go and they come and they go. But what's the difference? Why is this one different than any other leader? And what is he anointed for? Because like the priests and the Levites, if there was a reason for him, for them to be anointed, to be consecrated then what's the purpose of this person who just came out of nowhere saying the Lord is on me and I'm anointed? Well, we quickly get to verse 2 after the speaker kind of introduces themselves and says something specific to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. If this doesn't sound familiar to you, this has really strong imagery of the year of Jubilee, which a quick, going back to the Torah again, quick Torah lesson, was um, a time it happened, it was supposed to happen every 50 years among the Israelites where they let the land totally lie in rest. They weren't supposed to work. They weren't supposed to do any kind of work at all. And not only so, but all of the things that they may have bought from each other or that they maybe took from each other that weren't supposed to, or if any of them had become poor and had to enter into slavery or servanthood to another, all of that was supposed to be released and given back. Whatever land was your family's inheritance, if you had to sell some of it, whoever bought it from you is supposed to sell it back to you. It's a great reset, and it was commanded for every 50 years. The only problem, Israel never did it. Just like the anointed leaders were supposed to do something, and they kind of did it or maybe didn't really do it, is we never see any evidence that Israel practiced the Jubilee year. But this was how they were supposed to live. And it's kind of hard for us to like wrap our minds around it because we've never seen it done before. And we definitely don't practice it here in the U.S. But can you imagine every 50 years, which is really not that long, everything goes back to the original owner. If you have somebody working for you to pay off debts, it's done. They're released. They're free to go. You give things back and you don't work. And you live off of the abundance of the food, uh, the work that you did the years before. It's really kind of hard to imagine it, but the Lord gives a reason in Leviticus 25 for why he does this. And he says, the land is mine, and you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. Like I said before, it's also supposed to be a Sabbath rest, which we know Sabbath is commanded to remember the created order of things in which God created everything and then rested. So for the people of God to be the people of God, they're supposed to practice this jubilee-like thing, and they don't. I mean, that's just it. The people of God aren't, don't really look like the people of God right now, right? We are going to get into that a little bit more later, but uh, the speaker is talking about um, the brokenhearted, captives, prisoners, those who grieve, those who mourn. This doesn't look like how the people of God are supposed to, just like how they never really practiced the Jubilee year, had a great restoration of everything and a rest like they were supposed to. So again, while we can't imagine this for ourselves and our society, this is not really a foreign concept for us because we have ingrained in us an understanding of that things are supposed to be made right, right? You know, if you, um, like an Israelite, uh, came across some financial trouble and you had to sell your, some of your family's land and you still couldn't come up with it and you had to enter into servitude for another Israelite, that's just, that, that's hard. And we know that that's not how it's supposed to be. And... Um, when hardships come in our lives, we have this sense of like, this isn't right, you know? Again, we're talking about righteousness and justice throughout this series. When the hard things come, it's just like, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. There's supposed to be something that's supposed to restore this. And that is exactly what God was trying to implement with the Jubilee year. 
And again, we know this because all of our stories, our movies, our TV shows reflect this, right? Something bad happens at the beginning of the show or the movie or the book. You're supposed to see it resolved at the end, right? There's a literary device for this, but I won't bore you with my English major talk. But I can't help it, but you know, there's this little uh, trilogy of books called The Lord of the Rings. Maybe you've heard of it. At the beginning, if you have a character saying, oh, no, there's this ring, and it's like the epitome of all evil, and the darkest, most evilest person put his soul into it, and now because it still exists, darkness is spreading over the land, and the only way to stop it is to destroy it. And then you don't destroy that ring at the end of the book. It's like, what? You know, like, we, we can't even really, like, think about what that would look like. You'd be like, okay, well, that has to be, like, fourth book, right? Or, like, other series. Or, like, maybe Amazon buy, buys the rights and they make another series that's, like, a prequel and it's coming out in a few, few months and some of us are excited about it. Anyway, <clears throat> I digress. Or maybe, you know, you're like, well, what if, like, Simba just, like, decided to hang out with Timon and Pumbaa in the jungle and he's like, hmm, you know, Scar, that was bad and all that, but I got it pretty good here. I can just chill here. No, like, we know that Simba is supposed to go back and take over Pride Rock. You know what I'm saying? These are just a few examples, but these are how all of our stories go. This is how our thought process is. If it's wrong, it's supposed to be made right. God knew this. He created a system so that it would be just like that. Okay, so this passage is describing a jubilee-like state in which the people of God, from their shame, from their humiliation, their exile, are supposed to be restored back to being like the people of God to have joy again, to have fruitfulness again, to have their cities back that were destroyed again. But why? Just so they could have their stuff back so that they could have their stuff back? I mean, that seems like almost a good enough reason. But then again, it's kind of like, well, then what? You know, the ring was destroyed, so hooray, that's great, I guess. I guess we'll just go back to the Shire and, you know, have a mug of ale. Sounds pretty good to me. Um, But we lose part of the narrative if we forget about the other group that's mentioned here in this passage, which is, um, there's different words used for it, but the nations, the peoples, the world. There's another group that Israel is interacting with here, people of Israel interacting with. Of course, Israel is supposed to be the special set-apart people, but for what reason? Because there were promises made to Israel throughout Scripture, and we see it happen again and again, that they were supposed to be a light to these people. That they were supposed to be a way of these people entering into salvation. If you need some examples, Genesis 12, when God calls Abraham, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Exodus 19, whenever um, Israel is entering into covenant with God, with the giving of the, the law, he says, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Going back to our passage today, verse, verses 5 through 7 right in the middle, describe that exact, that exact thing. It uses that exact language that they are to be ministers and priests. Just like the Levites that we talked about earlier. They were kind of pulled out and away from Israel. Not away from to be separate, but to have a different role. And they were clothed differently and they were anointed to play that specific role. This is what Israel was supposed to be for all the nations. And uh, the passage talks about that the world will supply wealth for them, that they will work in their fields, that Israel will live off of the wealth of the nations. They'll be giving to Israel, and Israel will live off of it. And in return, Israel plays this role of blessing the nations by welcoming them in to the covenant promise of salvation that was originally only promised to them. And we know this through Scripture. This is a part of repeating a pattern of Scripture in the New Covenant, that there would be a descendant from David, who's kind of like the ideal, you know, Israelite person, who would bring the New Covenant and who would bring in uh, the promise for all peoples, for all nations. I have the benefit of and the blessing of being the youngest child of three, three boys. Um, so I'm the baby. And... Um, I had the blissful ignorance of most of my life until I was an adult of realizing that things were really easy, of uh, not realizing, sorry, for the longest time that things were easier for me because someone had already done them for me. You know what I'm saying? Some of you already, some of you, yeah, you know. Um, Throughout a lot of my life, I got to see my brothers, two older brothers, do things and learn from them. 
also I was the baby, and so, you know, maybe there, maybe just a little bit of spoiling going on for my parents, you know, and that kind of thing. Maybe, maybe, maybe I was just a better child. Who knows? They're not here. Um, but I had the benefit of not really knowing how easy things were for me sometimes because someone else had done them for me. One great example is my uh, next oldest brother, uh, Josh, who I got to see make a lot of decisions. A lot of them were not great decisions, especially during a certain time period like middle school to early high school. I got to see him make those decisions, see my parents' response, and be like, you know what, I don't think I'm going to do that. That doesn't seem like a very good idea. That happened a lot because I saw him get a lot of spankings and I got a very minimal amount. Um, <laughs> similar with Israel, Israel was supposed to play this big brother role, kind of intermediary. They're not the parents, but they're a way, they're an older brother, one who came first, who helps show the way things are done. Similarly, my brother also ended up being a very large influence on my life and my faith later on in my life. I saw when he in college, really turned from the life he was living and turned to the Lord. And he's actually a pastor now in the Dallas area in Texas. And he became the kind of person I really would love to, a kind of person I'd love to model my life off of. He's an awesome father, awesome friend, just a funny guy. He has been a model to me in more ways than one. This is the role that Israel is supposed to play in a way of being different, separate, not necessarily better, to show the nations to God. Um, an interesting thing happens around verse 8 where uh, the voice of the speaker of the passage changes. Instead of it being this anointed person speaking, it's all of a sudden the Lord speaking. It's kind of out of nowhere. Um, and he says, I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing in my faithfulness. I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. The Lord himself in his own voice confirms this, that it's the role of Israel to step into their place so that the nations would see and give glory to God. When Israel is in their rightful place, that righteousness and glory of God spreads throughout the world. And this was always the plan, always the plan of salvation for Israel and to other people. But... If we need an anointed one to do this, to help bring about this way of being, we have a little slight problem in this passage because this anointed one kind of popped in on the scene and never really introduced himself. We're just kind of like, okay, I trust you because you said the sovereign Lord did it. Obviously, we have the whole book of Isaiah, which gives a lot of reference for this speaker. But in order to understand this way of the Lord's set of a jubilee-like way of living, Things are restored, and Israel is a light to the nations. We need to know the anointed one who is to do it. It's easy once you get kind of further into the passage to forget about that the whole thing started with the anointed, the anointed one saying, the Lord anointed me to do this. Um, some of you who are familiar with the Bible might realize there's one kind of key passage here that I haven't read yet. Um, and that is actually Luke 4, starting at verse 14. I don't know if we'll have it on the screen, so I'm just going to read it for you real quick. But we'll go through verse 22. It says this, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. This is the beginning of Jesus starting his ministry. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, and surprise, surprise. Quote, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And he says later on, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. It's a little bit of a mic drop for Jesus. It kind of literally picture him just like, dropping the scroll and it's just kind of like, but in this awesome moment, the beginning of the Lord's ministry, he's reading this very passage, which is centuries old at this point, And he's just like, all right, today, um, now you know who this anointed one is and sits down, which is a really big deal. Again, it's been hard for us to understand this, but these people have been wondering who is this anointed one for a long time. And they knew in concept, 
other passages, even within Isaiah that we've talked about in this series, talk about a suffering servant, talk about the Messiah figure. And they had been arguing and looking forever and ever and ever and ever. And this guy in Podunk, Israel, just stands up in church one day and is like, it's me. And sits back down. But the gravity of the situation is that Jesus is the anointed one by which everything else in this passage happens. Seeing all these good things turn to bad seeing cities that were literally totally destroyed being rebuilt. And obviously there's a context in which this was a promise for Israel that was to come true. But Jesus says this is fulfilled today in your hearing because he is the one who's to proclaim the freedom for the captives, released from the darkness, the prisoners, and so on and so forth. He doesn't just offer us relief for our troubles here and now, but he brought a cosmic, eternal relief for our troubles, for sin and death that we are bound to, we're bound to, in our own sinfulness. He doesn't just bring about a jubilee year. He brings about a jubilee eternity, a jubilee lifestyle. He was anointed for a specific purpose, and he is the only biblical person to fully achieve that purpose without fault or failure mixed in in any sort of way. There's one last uh, little section of this scripture. It's uh, verses 10 and 11, which we didn't read today, but it's the last part of the chapter, so I might as well finish it off, you know. And what's interesting about these uh, verses is that the speaker changes again. So we had the very beginning, the anointed one who kind of pops in and is like, I'm the anointed one. And then Jesus, uh, sorry, the Lord speaks later on his own and says, yes, this is this is good and right. I am the Lord. I hate bad things. And here's the good things that are going to happen to my people and they will be a light to the nations. But then in verse 10 and 11, the speaker speaks, uh, switches again, starts off with, I delight greatly in the Lord. So we know it's not the Lord, but we're not exactly sure who it is. And it was interesting looking into this because it's kind of anyone's guess. I think there's probably good arguments for both sides from, what, from the bit that I read. Some propose that it's the anointed one again, uh, the Messiah figure, Jesus, speaking. Some people say that it is Israel, the people of Israel, the people of God, uh, speaking in kind of a redeemed state. They've now, all the uh, things that were promised, all the things the anointed one was going to do, they're on the other side of it, and they're speaking in response to what the anointed one has done, praising the Lord, talking about how he has clothed us with righteousness and salvation, arrayed us with a robe, that he's like a bridegroom who adorns us and so on and so forth. But what's interesting to me, it seems to me, the fact that we don't quite know if this is the servant, the anointed one speaking, or the people of Israel speaking, that it could maybe be both or either. It gives a kind of impression that this person is either way responding to what is happening in this passage with praise to the Lord, with adoration, talking about being devoted to the Lord and delighting in the Lord, and finishing on verse 11, talking about how um, in the same way that soil makes a sprout come to life and makes a seed to grow, the Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up for all nations. This person is responding. It's not easy to tell if it's, this, if it's the anointed one or if it's Israel. It's not the Lord specifically because it talks about the Lord. So could it be that when we come into our permanent jubilee state, when the people of Israel reach their fullness, that they look so much like the anointed one that it's hard to tell where the anointed one ends and the people of God begin. That the ultimate goal, ultimate result is this absolute adoration and praise and thanks for the Lord, recognition of what he has done and the multiplication of righteousness like a garden, like something growing and springing up before all the nations. And looking at our political leaders, our social leaders, um, and even the other biblical leaders that we mentioned before, is there anyone whose works have made us respond in this way? That we can really say, I have seen so many good things happen. I saw this injustice dealt with. I saw righteousness spring up. All of this has been dealt with, or at least even some of it, at least even most of it, the thing that I'm most passionate about has finally reached an end. And I am so thankful that I want to compare myself like a bride marrying that person. I, in my wedding dress, Joe Biden, let's go. In my wedding dress, Donald Trump, let's do this. No, it was absolutely not. Does their work even result in greater works being done? How often do you, I mean, there's been some great people throughout history, so I'm not trying to, you know, put anybody down. I could name some really great names of people, but 
how many of even the greatest ones have we said, wow, they did such good things that I'm seeing a multiplication 30 times, 40 times, 100 times of their good works being done in the world. And the whole world is becoming more and more righteous and just every day because of that one person's actions. I can't think of anybody, not to that degree, especially not to the point that I would say I would devote my life to them and I would praise them in that way. And so like the servant, the anointed one, and like the people of Israel, I'd like to invite us into a space here in this evening to meditate on the anointed one who is the one who brings about all this. I think Ronjo and Aletha are going to come back up and do a little bit more worship, but the one thing we know from this passage is that we need the anointed one, we need his message, we need his actions in order to see the jubilee year, the jubilee life, the jubilee infinity happen. And so I just feel like there's probably varying degrees to which we could respond to this right now. Maybe you have never really known the anointed one. You've never really come to know Jesus in any form or fashion. And you definitely don't feel like you've seen injustices in your life um, been made right. Or you've been brokenhearted and you've seen healing and comfort come. Or maybe you have seen that, but just the past week has been a little more rough, the past day. There's seriously so many things we could talk about in the news that could hit people in just almost traumatic ways of some of the terrible things that are happening in our nation, let alone our world. So I'd like to invite us into a space where we are responding to the anointed one who said the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me to bring good news, to proclaim good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim freedom to captives and release from darkness. So I'm going to take a second. I'm just going to pray and ask that you pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the way that you reveal yourself in your word. Lord, we thank you for the message of salvation, of righteousness and justice being brought to your people who have experienced extreme hardship, Lord. I just pray over all of us right now who could probably run the gamut of the things that we're struggling with right now, the things that we just are. Ah, this is not right and it needs to, something needs to change, needs to be made right. Or even just experiencing injustice done to other people and we just, our hearts hurt for the sin and pain in this world, Lord. I pray that wherever we are, we just ask that we would have a fuller, greater revelation of the anointed one, you, Jesus. Of the way in which you are binding us up, the way in which you are freeing us in the way in which you are clothing us with righteousness, anointing us with oil. And I pray on this day, right in the middle of summer, with all things going on, that we would be able to truly leave those things to you because it is your work, Jesus, that brings about the redemption of those things, that brings about the jubilee. And I pray that nobody who needs that jubilee would leave this room without receiving it, Jesus. In Jesus' name. So we just ask, Lord, that you would reveal to us, speak to us, images or words, confirmation in our spirits, Lord, what you want to say and do. sing this, our closing song, but as we stay in this attitude of prayer, I want to, we usually save words for ministry time, but I want to share this one now because it relates to what Judah was talking about and was given by someone who didn't know what Judah was going to be talking about. And this idea of waiting for a Messiah, this person prepping for worship had this vision of God speaking to his children. He said,
I'm just a breath away. When you acknowledge me, I am there already before you. Just call on me. So let's stand together and we're gonna we're gonna close our service by calling on the Lord. Just acknowledging that we do need a Savior. We do need our Messiah to make things right. transition into ministry time and if you're not familiar with what that is it's just a space where we create where um, we can just spend time in God's presence where we can hear his voice where we can have people pray for you so I want to invite prayer ministers to go and come up now we'll have prayer ministers on either side if you want to just stay in your pew and worship if you want to come to the altar and just spend time at the kneeling rails no one will bother you but if you would like to have someone pray for you, if you have God just moving in your heart, you would like someone to pray with you about that. If you have a, a hurt or pain in your body, we believe that God heals when we ask. Our prayer ministers would be happy to pray for that. If you just need to spend time calling on the Lord and acknowledging him as your Messiah, would you do that? 
So I want to release you. If, you're, if it's time for you to go, would you go in grace and peace? And if you want to stay and just um, meditate in God's presence, you're welcome to stay and do that. God bless. my shepherd I will not want He makes me lie in pastures green He leads me by the still still waters His goodness restores my soul I will trust in you alone. Lord, I will trust in you alone. For your endless mercy follows me. Your goodness will
You are the great shepherd, the Lord of the world. My shepherd hears my voice. Sweet. 